Yeah, I don't think Mother knew about this. Uncle Marvin was strangled by his own beard. Yep, you never saw it coming. Welcome, America, to America's Family History Show, Extreme Genes and ExtremeGenes.com. It is Fisher here, your radio root sleuth on the program where we shake your family tree and watch the nuts fall out. And this segment of the show is brought to you by LegacyTree.com genealogists. And coming up in the show today, how do you lose a cemetery? Yeah, Chicago actually managed to do this, and it's kind of a frightening thing, and it's it's a lesson for all of us, by the way, if we're concerned about where our dead are buried, where the records are kept, and what is happening with the remains of our ancestors. Barry Flagg is a former Chicago resident who lives in Arizona right now, and we're going to be talking to him in about 10 minutes about his part in helping to collect the records and making sure that people who had ancestors in this lost cemetery know where they were, and that type of thing. Fascinating conversation coming up in just a little bit. You're going to want to hear it. And later in the show, we're always telling you about unexpected results with DNA. This one hit real close to home, and that's about all I'm going to say about it. Mike and Logan Laughlin are going to be talking to me here in uh, just a little bit, so we're looking forward to hearing from them as well. Right now, it's time to head out to New England and Boston and the New England Historic Genealogical Society and their chief genealogist, David Allen Lambert. How are you? Yes, sir. I'm doing great, Fish. Just back from NGS in uh, Grand Rapids, Michigan. I got to meet some of our listeners, which was always fun. And I was also honored recently to have David McCullough receive a genealogy that I researched. That's awesome. The great historian. So yeah, are, are you a, related yeah. to him? I am, and actually I am, and so is Ernest Hemingway and Emily Dickinson, and chances are he's probably related to you, Fish. We'll have to compare notes. (laughs) (laughs) We'll have to compare notes. Well, that's awesome. What a great thing to, to know that you've done his work. Well, I'll tell you, there are so many people out there doing genealogy, and I'm very grateful for Family Search, and Family Search has now two billion records online. That's images. That is amazing. That's right. You know, it's it's a question always that we hear is, what is a record? Is it the census? Is it the entire page? Or is it just the name on the page? But in this case, they're very specific. They've got two billion images up now on FamilySearch.org, of course, one of our sponsors, and we're very excited for them and send congratulations. North America leads the list with over 711 million, then it goes to Europe with over 678 million, and then Latin America with 267 million. So there's something in there for everybody. Boy, that's incredible. I just want to say that I have to expand my Christmas list uh, of cards this year because being Irish, which is what I'm predominantly on Ancestry and a lot of the other kits, uh, it tells us now by statistics that 14,000 people living today are probably related to me based on my Irish roots. A study that was done with Ancestry went through and found out that there are probably 17,558 people related to any of the given 5,300 people from <laughs> Ulster. <laughs> so if you thought your family was small, guess again. Oh, my and goodness. And this is based on fifth to eighth cousins living up to about 200 years ago. That's incredible. Wow, that's yeah. a fun story. Who knew? I'm sure the Irish are thrilling. Dancing a jig. I'm sure they are. And if I could only find out where my John Lambert from Ireland came from in 1792, I'd dance along with them. Yeah, I understand. <laughs> okay. Going a little further east, touching upon the royals, but a real cutie at that. Princess Charlotte, age three, who was trending on the internet with all of her cute waves when she went to visit her baby brother. But one of the stories that came up was, will her baby brother actually cause her to be further away from the throne? The answer is no. She actually can not lose her spot due to the Succession to the Crown Act of 2013. So her older brother, herself, and now her baby brother in that order. And this is because it was changed by Parliament. That's amazing. It is. For I hundreds not... upon hundreds of years, it, the yeah. girls always went to the end. I, I never understood how slow England is to change things. They're so steeped in tradition. The fact that they would change that in 2013 is absolutely amazing. And obviously, they had somebody like Charlotte in mind. Well, congratulations to the little princess. Yeah, absolutely. 
And we should probably mention the birthday of the great-grandmother of Princess Charlotte, and of course that is Queen Elizabeth II of England, who just turned 92. She has been the queen since I was born. You know, this is me too. I mean, most of the world has been around the entire time she has been queen. She went in, I think, in what fifty three. That's exactly when she went yeah. in, and she is, of course, the longest ruling English monarch, but only comes in third to all the European, including Franz Joseph and King Louis the Fourteenth of France. Hey, did you see the news about that German U-boat they found? World War II won this time. Yeah, this is amazing. If you recall last year, history was doing this whole thing on finding Hitler in South America. And the story was a U-boat took him from perhaps up in Denmark to South America. And there was supposed to be this U-3523 that was uh, one of the subs suspected to be perhaps the one that carried him and some of his henchmen to South America. Well, they have finally found the wreckage after all these years, sunk by a British bomber plane. And uh, it's it's so deep, it's 403 feet down, buried in the sand, so it's not going to be uh, accessed anytime soon. But at the end of the day, Hitler did not go to South America on this U-boat. Well... Question is, is he on that U boat? That there's a question, <laughs> right? Okay. I'll tell you, every week I like to talk about a blogger spotlight, and this is one I actually met at a conference. A very nice gentleman by the name of Alfred Wallacott the Third. He is an author and speaks about his ancestors and different aspects of history. It's always a learning experience when I read his blog at my four legged stool. dot com. Okay, my four legged stool. dot com. It's not the number four; it's the word four, right? Correct. All right. Very good. And thank you, Alfred, for contributing to the genealogical discussion. And, of course, NEHS just loves to have everyone in a discussion here at our library in Boston. So if you're not a member, think about joining uh, American Ancestors, and you can save $20 off a membership by using the checkout code EXTREME for Extreme Genes. All right, David. Thank you so much, and we'll talk to you again next week. All right, look forward to it. All right, and coming up next, we're going to talk to a guy who went to bat, went to war, actually, for a cemetery that was lost in Chicago. How was it lost? How was it found? What's happening with the records? I'm going to talk to Barry Flagg in Arizona, coming up next on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show. Did you know that FamilySearch Family Tree is available through a powerful new mobile app experience? That's right. Now you can view, edit, and even add information to ancestors in your family tree whenever and wherever you are. You no longer need to wait to get home or make a date with your computer to view or update your family tree. You can add details to your tree when visiting with family or when capturing details from a trip to the cemetery. You can share new family history discoveries from classroom settings. You can even make the most of your time when waiting for doctor appointments or car repairs. Get started today by downloading the free Family Search Family Tree app to your Apple or Android device. Visit familysearch.org slash tree app to get the Family Tree app for free. Exploring and expanding your family tree has never been more convenient. Visit familysearch.org slash tree app to download the Family Search Family Tree mobile app today. Legacy Tree Genealogist is a proud sponsor of Extreme Genes. Based in Salt Lake City, Utah, near the world's largest family history library, we've worked with genealogists all over the globe since 2004 to track down records, find your ancestors, and the stories that bring your legacy to life. We also analyze DNA test results, help you join lineage societies, and find missing cousins. Legacy Tree is the recommended research partner of MyHeritage.com and is the world's highest client-rated genealogy firm. Call us toll free at 1-800-818-1476 or register online to get a free estimate right now you can save up to 100 dollars on professional genealogy research but hurry this offer expires at the end of the month even experienced researchers can benefit from our proven and experienced staff of specialists who can bring new approaches to old problems learn from our free genealogy tips on our blog at legacytree.com slash blog legacy tree genealogists we do the research you enjoy the discoveries 
Hi, Genies. It's Scott Fisher, host of Extreme Jeans, with an invitation for you to join our brand spanking new Extreme Jeans Patrons Club. Now, the Extreme Jeans Patrons Club is where, for as little as a dollar a month, Genies everywhere can take advantage of Extreme Jeans rewards, such as early access to our latest podcasts, members-only bonus podcasts, acknowledgement on ExtremeJeans.com, and special monthly live online question and answer sessions with well-known family history experts. Catch visits with Genie Technology stars such as David Allen Lambert, photo detective Maureen Taylor, DNA expert C.C. Moore, and many other experts and storytellers. If you find yourself craving more stories, more ideas for digging up your dead, more inspiration, the Extreme Genes Patrons Club is for you. The rewards start at just a dollar a month. Find out more now. Just go to ExtremeGenes.com and click on our special Extreme Genes Patrons Club link at the top right. Or go to Patreon.com slash Extreme Genes. We are back. It is America's Family History Show, Extreme Genes and ExtremeGenes.com. Fisher here, your radio root sleuth. This segment is brought to you by FamilySearch.org. And on the line with me right now is a a great guest from Arizona, down in Phoenix, escaped the cold weather of Chicago, where he lived for many, many years. Barry Flagg, a longtime researcher. You even go back earlier than me, Barry. Why would you leave the area that you were most passionate about? Well, I'm 73 years old, but 20 years ago, I didn't want to shovel snow anymore in Chicago. (laughs) That'll do it. And you know what? There's so much you can do online now anyway that makes such a big difference. So that really worked out for you. Well, Barry has been into the cemetery world for a long, long time. And a fascinating tale came up some time back that he got involved with that's now kind of carried over for many decades as he's looked into this particular cemetery in Chicago that disappeared. They lost this cemetery in Chicago. And Barry, how do you lose a major cemetery? Well, this particular cemetery was on the grounds of the Cook County Poor Farm and Insane Asylum, and it was behind a big iron fence, and it was a scary place. So a lot of the neighbors, a lot of the area didn't even know it was there. And over the years, land was recycled. It was turned into cottages and and other buildings. It was just forgotten. There were only wooden markers, and they didn't last. No, they never do, do they? So how many acres are we talking here? The property itself uh, was 320 acres. It was as much as 100 and some buildings. A lot of it was farmland, about 200 acres was farm, but the cemetery itself was about 25 acres. Okay. And so what era did that cover? The poor farm opened in 1854, and people were old and and didn't do so well, so as they died, they were just buried out in the backyard. So it wasn't officially a cemetery. It wasn't designated as one. It was just part of the property of the insane asylum. Right. It was convenient for Cook County to bury the people where they died. But very quickly after that, they established it as a pauper's cemetery for the entire city and county. Okay. And so how does the city and county then lose this to developers. I mean, as they started to develop their, what was it, in the 80s, they're they're finding skulls and bones and legs and all kinds of things, and they had to stop, and you got involved. Um, It's real simple. Cemeteries don't count. They don't pay taxes. They don't vote. Well, they do in Chicago. (laughs) Uh, For the most part, cemeteries are in the way. Politicians looked at this land and said, hey, I can make money selling it to a developer. Okay. You mean on behalf of the city and county? Right. It went from the county to the state in 1912, and then it went to the city. Okay. How many people were buried in there overall, and when was the last burial? I have estimated, and no one has been able to dispute, 38,000 bodies. Oh, my gosh. And when was the last one buried there? Uh, Officially, the county got rid of the property in 1912 for a dollar to the state. But there were some burials into the 1920s, and that would have been about it. Okay, so when all this started happening, there had to be, you know, grandchildren of some of these people still around who were kind of appalled by what was going on. 
Oh, absolutely. As I say, I get maybe a letter a month from somebody looking for Uncle Louie, and every once in a while we do have a genuine relative. Wow. And so what has been the resolution of this big mess? Well, we have the Memorial Park. It's called the Reed Dunning Memorial Park. It's about three acres. It's a small portion of the old grounds. The new grounds has a plaque, and we're hoping that the rest of the area won't be any more disturbed than it is. Right. What what did they do with the remains that were dug up as they started to develop there? They were examined by the uh, coroner, the medical examiner, and they have been reburied quietly in a corner of the memorial park. So they just have never been able to identify who any of those people were or where they belonged or what happened to them. That, that's really no, quite tragic. So, some of them were quite whole. Some of them had sweaters on and mutton chop facial hair. I mean, they were well preserved in clay. Oh, my gosh, that's unbelievable. That would be kind of creepy to live there now. I'm I'm thinking, wow. Um, Most of the bodies are still under the ground, even though houses were built and condos were built on top. It's almost a little poltergeist. Yeah, yeah. I, I want you got to wonder if there aren't stories around there, right, around that development. My goodness. Uh, Scott, I have to tell you, there was a lady that was a, an, a, a patient in the institution, in the insane asylum. She was interviewed, and she said, ghosts are coming up through the floor of my cottage. And she had no idea about the cemetery. Oh, my gosh. That's this incredible. This is a true story. The administrator uh, interviewed her. She was moved to another cottage where she said, there's no more ghosts coming up through the floor. (laughs) So it wasn't in her mind, apparently. Wow. No, no, no. Um, You know, there's some things we just don't understand. So you've kind of become the official record keeper for this cemetery because people keep coming to you. Reporters keep coming to you. How did you get started in all this, Barry? It was a cheap date. Uh, On Sunday (laughs) after church... A lady friend and I would go out for a ride, and the car would always make a right-hand turn into a cemetery. We would read the stones. We would try to guess about the people. And then friends would ask, what are you guys doing? What's your favorite ones? And that started a book that I was writing about cemeteries in Chicago. The cemetery book had to be put aside because of of Cook County Cemetery in 1989 when, when this all hit. But now it's a website. I have a website out there where I get to tell all my stories. That is so much fun. And, you know, the cemeteries are just loaded with tales, not just about the individuals, but the history of the place itself and strange burials and things that take place there. I mean, I just find them fascinating places and typically really peaceful and beautiful places. Yes. And more important, they tell us who we were. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Especially when you start going through the names and the the people where they're buried together. and Even the locations of the graves have stories to tell. Absolutely. It's a living history book. Yeah, absolutely. So you've been doing that for many, many years. Is that in addition to being a genealogist? Yeah, the family history portion of my life, the genealogy is... It was pretty well done over a number of years, so I still poke at it, but cemeteries are my passion. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So how do people lose a cemetery? What's the warning you take from your story in Chicago for people in other, I would assume, large metropolitan areas, but maybe you might even consider some out in the country? The biggest threat is developers, builders with those big yellow bulldozers and excavators. Land is more valuable to a builder than a cemetery. And so my advice to anybody in another area would be keep an eye on a cemetery because that land would easily be gobbled up by a developer. And they can either move the bodies or they can preserve it, but they don't like to do either one. Yeah, yeah, right. you got to do one or the other if you're going to develop an area like that, right? Yeah. You know, look at old maps. Just about everywhere there were burials. There are 273 burials in the Chicago area. Burial sites? Cemetery sites, yes. Uh, many of which are under streets, under buildings. you got to remember, in the old days, they just buried them out in the backyard or on the farm in the corner. 
Yeah, that's right. And in fact, if you look at New York City, there were tons of cemeteries there because the city really started at the southern end of the island and started moving north. And they had to move a lot of those bodies to like Blackwell Island and then over to Cypress Hills and uh, other of the, exactly. the major cemeteries in Brooklyn as well. So it's really kind of a common thing. But as a family member to people who are buried in places like this, you need to be somewhat vigilant. And I would assume it's the politicians you have to hold to account for what they're going to do with that land, yes? Yes. Vigilant is the best word, the best advice I could offer. Have you ever run into a church that was selling off cemetery property? They don't sell off. The big one was St. John's Cemetery out near O'Hare Field, and it was in the way of a new runway they wanted to build. So the city did move all those bodies, and it was a Lutheran Church cemetery. But there they had to go through a whole lot of legal procedure and contact all the relatives because it was well marked. It was an active cemetery. Wow. Yeah, that would stir up a lot of emotion, I would think. It did. The church fought it for many, many, many years. Uh, St. Saint Johannes or St. John's. And and in the same case, Cook County Cemetery, we just went through all kinds of lawyers and builders and the city, the county, the state. They tried to make the cemetery go away. It's just bones, they said. And I said, no, these are people's grandparents and aunts and uncles. They are real people that are buried there, all with a story. Have you collected a lot of those stories? I have indeed. The most famous is Thomas McRae. He's a Civil War colonel that's buried there. After the war, he was a uh, salesman for McCormick Reaper Corporation in Chicago. He fell ill. He died alone in Cook County Hospital, and the county buried him in my cemetery. Was his grave marked? No, none of the graves are marked. Uh, There's grave numbers uh, in the new grounds, but no marks anymore. None at all. And that's because they marked them all with a wooden cross. Maybe not even that. You know, it was a potter's field. So I heard that there were some wood markers, but, you know, it depends on the era. Unbelievable. He's Barry Flagg. He's in Phoenix, Arizona, a passionate genie from the Chicago area who's gone through a a lot of hard work to try to help deal with the remains of lost loved ones from years ago in the Chicago area. Barry, thanks so much for your insight. Fascinating stuff, and uh, good luck with your work. Well, thank you very much. And by the way, if you want to find out more, go to cookcountycemetery.com. And coming up next, another one of those unexpected DNA results when we return on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show. Scientific studies have proven that youth who know even a little bit about their family history perform better academically and have a greater sense of personal confidence and stability. Genealogy is its own incredible superpower that arms our children with super strength. But how do you get your child or grandchild interested in studying their family history? That kind of stuff is just for grandmas, right? Not anymore. ZapTheGrandmaGap.com leaps the generation gap in a single bound. Author Janet Havorka provides you with useful and timely advice on helping the young people in your life become engaged in their own family history. Janet has an entire collection of books to inspire the young and the young at heart in fun, interactive ways. She also offers creative tips and advice on her blog and in her free weekly newsletter. Stop by ZapTheGrandmaGap.com today to sign up for Janet's free email newsletter with 52 weeks of easy tips, free downloads, and order your set of resource books and workbooks. Looking for an easy way to show off your family history and share it with your family? Family Chart Masters offers beautiful custom pedigree art pieces and inexpensive family reunion draft charts in any design or size that fits your needs. With a free consultation at FamilyChartMasters.com, you can get started creating a new family masterpiece. Family Chart Masters has over 11 years of experience in creating and printing family charts. They can print any style of genealogy chart from any genealogy file and can create exactly what you're looking for. You'll work with a specialized and talented consultant whose goal is to make you happy. Decorative charts make fantastic gifts for all occasions. And with Family Chart Masters option of ordering duplicate charts at half price along with your original purchase at full price, you can afford to give a family heirloom to each member of your family. 
Contact Family Chartmasters today at FamilyChartmasters.com for your free consultation. Family Chartmasters will give the greatest care to your family history. Welcome back to America's Family History Show. It's Extreme Genes and ExtremeGenes.com. It is Fisher here, your radio root sleuth. And this segment is brought to you by LegacyTree.com. You know, the discoveries through DNA are pretty much endless. And there should be some little marker that, in a little bit bigger type that says unexpected results may happen because they happen all the time, right? People discover their parents weren't their parents or they're able to actually find perhaps that they had a child they didn't know about or the grandpa wasn't the grandpa. And this story came to me via one of our genies, a regular listener, Mike Laughlin. He's in Oklahoma. How are you, Mike? I'm doing well. First of all, how long have you been a genie? Probably about 10 years. That's awesome. And let's go through your story, too, because you had a, a girlfriend uh, back, what, in the 80s? Uh, mid-90s. Mid-90s. All right, fill us in on the yeah. story here. Okay, well, I don't know, I guess it was probably 95. My name was Melissa, and we were dating for a while, and we just kind of called it off and went our separate ways. And then some time had passed and started talking to each other again. And uh, when we started talking again, found out that she was pregnant. But she had told me that it, it was not mine. So eventually we got married and, you know, we just had our life and I raised Logan as my own and or us together as a family and that was it. And we kind of had our little family there for a while and eventually, 2003, Melissa came down with cancer uh, wow. and uh, she eventually passed away from cancer in 2003 on December 31st, New Year's Eve. So that's kind of the backstory to this this whole story. Now you went and yeah. took your stepson Logan, right, to to see a psychologist to try to break this news to him. How old was he at this time? Yeah, it was. It wasn't really a psychologist. I was going to OU, the local university here at the time, and there was a counselor there. I went and talked to uh, the counselor there. And said, "Hey, look, we have this situation where I have a son, but I'm not the biological father, and we're afraid. We don't want him to be one of those stories when he grows up and he's 30 and finds out that." You know, his parents weren't really his parents, and he's devastated. So she had suggested that we kind of explain the situation to him and allow him to ask the questions okay. uh, just, just so he could take ownership of the conversation. So we took the, the counselor's advice, and uh, we explained the story to him, and he kind of <laughs> – uh, do you even remember the slogan? No. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, he was he was four. He was probably four at the time, and, and he didn't really ask any questions, and so – you know, we just kind of let it go, and uh, everything is fine, and no big events or any concerns about who's my real dad or anything like that. Never never really came up. Sure. Well, because, Logan, you've known this pretty much your whole life, right? It, it never crossed your mind. I think there was, like, maybe one time that I had some teen angst, and I, I told the, you're not even my real dad. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think it was, like, one time that ever happened. So, Mike, then, you, you've been into genealogy all this time. You went on with your life, obviously, after Melissa passed. And yep. you've obviously done a lot of research over the years, and now DNA comes along. Yep, yep. So I took a DNA test, you know, just purely to see what kind of matches I would get. And so uh, I took the DNA test, my mom and my dad, and, you know, that way I could get my paternal line and my maternal line and isolate them and, you know, figure out who belongs to who and yada, yada, yada. So... So I did that for myself about a year ago, and I bought about four or five kits. Uh, and the intention was I was going to give them to my three brothers. Two of my brothers shot it down. They didn't want to take it. And I was like, all right, whatever. One of my brothers did. So I had all these leftover DNA kits. And I was like, well, you know, I'm going to offer them to the kids and see if they want to take them. And so all the kids took the DNA test. So my stepdaughter took it. I have a, another son named Jackson. He took it. And then Logan took it. And so we spit in the tubes and we shipped it off and waited on the results. And the results came <laughs> in. <laughs> and what a lovely yeah. surprise. Right. I actually was on my way to work. So I was in my car and was at a, a red light. And I, I looked down at my phone and, you know, I got an email. You know, your, your results are in. Clicked and it was loading. So I clicked the little Explore Your DNA link and it wasn't loading. You know, it wasn't loading. It wasn't loading. So the light turned green and I put my phone down and then all of a sudden it loaded. And it showed, here's your DNA matches. 
And I saw my little uh, my little picture in his DNA match list, and I was like, "You've got to be kidding me!" <laughs> I, I'm, I just got on the highway, just got on the highway, and I was like, "Okay, I'm going to pull over to the yeah to the highway." That's here really good that. wisdom, crazy. Mike. That's nuts. Yeah, <laughs> but so I was like, "Okay, I can wait ten seconds and take the exit." So I took the exit and got in the parking lot and checked it, and sure enough, there it was. And I was like, "Wait a minute!" Uh, Jack's DNA results had actually came in a week previous. Okay, and I was like, maybe I'm looking, maybe I'm looking you have at the wrong profile. account. Yeah, and now nah, it said Logan Lawson, so I refreshed it and checked it and went and looked at his results. And my other brother that was in there was shown as a relation to him, and I was like, you know, all these people were matching with him <laughs> that were the Laughlins. And I was like, I checked it like 20 different times before I called Logan. So it was in the morning uh, on the way to work, and uh, I'm actually surprised that, that Logan even answered the phone. But he did, and he was a little audibly irritated because it was so early. And so I told him, I said, you're not going to believe this. I go, I just got your uh, DNA results, and I'm, I'm, your, I'm your dad. I'm your real biological dad. <laughs> and he kind of goes, okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, now let's talk to Logan about this. Logan, he wakes you out of a sleep to tell you this. What did that do to your head that morning? Well, I'd actually, I'd already seen the results by then, like oh. the day before. Oh, and you, you didn't did, tell you him? Did, why, didn't you, why didn't you call me? Because I, I assumed that you were going to get them yourself. Oh, well, here's a little... And I didn't, I didn't know a uh, story. <laughs> <laughs> I had no clue how the website works. I know, I, you know, I've never really been in your genealogy then that you've got there. <laughs> So I just kind of assumed, oh, it must be because he's, he's uh, controlling my account or whatever. Right. He was the administrator. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I, I just assumed that, and I went on. And then I worked night shifts, and he called me at around probably 8 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, <laughs> it wasn't really fully a, a processing the first time we talked about it. <laughs> That's incredible. And so when he finally <laughs> did chat with you about it, how did you feel about it? Um, I'm not quite as excited as he is because, you know, he's, he's my dad. He's always been my dad. But it is still pretty incredible. Yeah, absolutely. You know, th th there's something about blood, you know, that brings people a little closer sometimes. And I'm sure you don't feel quite like the redheaded stepchild anymore. <laughs> yeah. Well, Mike and Logan, congratulations. It's a boy. And yeah. uh, do you have any recommendations for people taking their DNA tests? Well, at this point, be prepared for surprises. Yeah. <laughs> I, yeah. I, but I will say, I, I did not expect any surprises. I and mean, I guess that's why they call them surprises. That's why they but, call them surprises, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, I will say one other thing. I've been going through pictures recently as well. So there's all kind of cool things about this that have materialized. You know, I always think, well, what if Melissa and I had not gotten back together? Right. If I wouldn't have got back right. together with her, I might not have even known this, you know, or, or I might have not been able to experience Logan in an entire lifetime. That's you right. Know, maybe I find out when he's 25 or something. Sure. Know? Yeah. But I've got I've got all these great pictures of Logan with his real great grandparents. That's fantastic. He was around. And, and yeah, it's so incredible. And and the rest of our family and, and friends, everybody's just uh, always treated him as if he was one of their nephews, nieces, grandkids. It's all been so great. So it's kind of a happy byproduct of uh, just having all these great pictures well, with people that are gone. And it's very great. That's so incredible. Thanks so much, guys, for sharing your story. And, uh, Logan, you're, you're going to understand this a little more as you get older, I think, that this is a kind of a big deal. Trust yeah. me. Trust me on that, okay? <laughs> hey, thanks, guys, so much for sharing your story. Yeah, no yeah. problem. Happy to do it. Okay, so maybe the DNA companies don't give you a big enough warning, but that should be one right there. Sometimes you get the unexpected when you do your DNA testing. All right, coming up next, we talk preservation. Tom Perry is back from TMZPlace.com, answering your questions at Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show.
Legacy Tree Genealogists is a proud sponsor of Extreme Genes. Based in Salt Lake City, Utah, near the world's largest family history library, we've been working with genealogists all over the globe since 2004 to track down records, find your ancestors, and the stories that bring your legacy to life. We also analyze DNA test results, help you join lineage societies, and find missing cousins or heirs to property. Legacy Tree is the recommended research partner of MyHeritage.com and is the world's highest client-rated genealogy firm. Call us toll-free at 1-800-818-1476. Call now or register online to get a free estimate. Learn from our free genealogy tips on our blog at LegacyTree.com slash blog. Even experienced researchers can benefit from our proven and experienced staff of specialists who can bring new approaches to old problems. Legacy Tree Genealogists. We do the research. You enjoy the discoveries. LegacyTree.com. Did you know that FamilySearch Family Tree is available through a powerful new mobile app experience? That's right. Now you can view, edit, and even add information to ancestors in your family tree whenever and wherever you are. You no longer need to wait to get home or make a date with your computer to view or update your family tree. You can add details to your tree when visiting with family or when capturing details from a trip to the cemetery. You can share new family history discoveries from classroom settings. Settings. You can even make the most of your time when waiting for doctor appointments or car repairs. Get started today by downloading the free Family Search Family Tree app to your Apple or Android device. Visit familysearch.org slash tree app to get the Family Tree app for free. Exploring and expanding your family tree has never been more convenient. Visit familysearch.org slash tree app to download the Family Search Family Tree mobile app today. Hi, Genies. It's Scott Fisher, host of Extreme Genes, with an invitation for you to join our brand spanking new Extreme Genes Patrons Club. Now, the Extreme Genes Patrons Club is where, for as little as a dollar a month, Genies everywhere can take advantage of Extreme Genes rewards, such as early access to our latest podcasts, members-only bonus podcasts, acknowledgement on ExtremeGenes.com, and special monthly live online question and answer sessions with well-known family history experts. Catch visits with Ginny Genealogy stars such as David Allen Lambert, photo detective Maureen Taylor, DNA expert C.C. Moore, and many other experts and storytellers. If you find yourself craving more stories, more ideas for digging up your dead, more inspiration, the Extreme Genes Patrons Club is for you. The rewards start at just a dollar a month. Find out more now. Just go to ExtremeGenes.com and click on our special Extreme Genes Patrons Club link at the top right. Or go to Patreon.com slash ExtremeGenes. And welcome back. It's America's Family History Show, Extreme Genes, and it's time to talk preservation with Tom Perry from TMCPlace.com, our preservation authority. Tom's on the road again. How are you, Tom? I'm super duper loving this weather in Mexico. In Mexico. Very nice. All right. We hear from Shirley Long. She's in Virginia. And she says, I have many reels of tapes from both my mother and my father. And I'd like to copy off those segments which pertain to family members that I know. She says, so I'm writing you to ask if this is something I could do myself. The tapes have already been waiting around 20 years. I don't even know what condition they are in. Shirley Long. Well, Shirley, that's a very big an involved question. Let me start at the very beginning. If this was my best suggestion, I would say, no, you can't do this yourself. Physically, you can, but it's something that's very time-consuming. If it's not just done right, you're not going to have really good content. And like we have said on the show over and over again, it depends what your end juice is. If you just want to get these clips down and dirty, it doesn't matter the good quality of them. You don't worry about that. You just somehow want to preserve then yeah you can go to you know a local store and get a product you can hook up to your camcorder that plugs in your computer and just transfer the pieces you want however you're going to have problems with speed on your computer you're going to have problems with lag you're going to have problems with getting stuff in your video artifacts and different things like that so there's going to be a whole bunch of soup so to speak mixed in with your video which does not look good no but if you don't care about that and that's okay then knock yourself out go that way if you want something that looks better your next step is, unfortunately, it's what you don't want, but this is the most economical way to do it. 
Find a place, whether you ship them to us or find somebody in your area or use one of the home video studio places. You can take your video and put it on a DVD. That's going to be the most economical way to do it. Then take your DVDs and put them in Wondershare, which we talk about all the time, and go in and edit them there, turn them into whatever kind of format you want, whether you want to put them on an iPhone, if you want them just in the cloud. It gives you so many different options. If you want something a little bit simpler, you can always go to iMovie, Final Cut Pro for Mac users. You can go into things like Power Director. You can go into different programs that are made for Windows. You can edit it also. Yeah, but I got to so, tell you, I, you know, I just used Wondershare the other day, and I'm not a master video editor by any means, but that thing is really pretty easy. And with just oh, a little is. bit of effort and even just playing around with it, you can figure it out. And Wondershare is so wonderfully cheap as well. And so it's nice because you can clip ends off of videos. Uh, we did something where I actually staged a little event and I got to the end of it and they didn't turn the camera off in time. So I was able to clip that very easily. But it's really nice to go into a lengthy bit of video and just take out clips so that you have them separately. If, for instance, if you had a, a VHS tape from back in the 90s, and you have a series of different clips, you can easily take those out and make them into separate segments and get rid of the junk. Oh, absolutely. I love Wondershare. It's one of the ones I was telling people at RootsTech, this is a must-have piece of software, whether you're a Mac user, a PC user, Windows, whatever format you're using. This is a program that you need to have in your quiver. And as you said, it's not very expensive. And their tech services are beyond anybody I've ever worked with. These guys listen to you. They love what they do. It's not just a job for them. It's just like when Facebook first started out and Apple first started out. They were just totally into helping people and doing all kinds of wonderful things. So I love the program. So, you know, if you want to get the stuff on a disc, it's easy to put the DVD in your computer, go into Wondershare, pick out the pieces you want, and go forward. And that's for sure going to be the most economical way to do it. If money's not as bad of a problem as your time, then you want to go to somebody that will turn it into like an MP4 or an AVI or an MLV, so then you just drop it into Wondershare and automatically start editing. You don't have to do any conversions. And that's a little bit more expensive. The quality is a little bit better, but for 90% of us, the little bit difference in quality isn't worth doing the AVI and the MLV route and things like that. All right, great answer, Tom, and great question, Shirley. Thanks so much for reaching out to us, and we got another listener question coming up for you next on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show in three minutes. Looking for an easy way to show off your family history and share it with your family? Family Chartmasters offers beautiful custom pedigree art pieces and inexpensive family reunion draft charts in any design or size that fits your needs. With a free consultation at FamilyChartmasters.com, you can get started creating a new family masterpiece. Family Chartmasters has over 11 years of experience in creating and printing family charts. They can print any style of genealogy chart from any genealogy file and can create exactly what you're looking for. You'll work with a specialized and talented consultant whose goal is to make you happy. Decorative charts make fantastic gifts for all occasions. And with Family Chart Master's option of ordering duplicate charts at half price along with your original purchase at full price, you can afford to give a family heirloom to each member of your family. Contact Family Chart Masters today at FamilyChartMasters.com for your free consultation. Family Chart Masters will give the greatest care to your family history. When was the last time you heard your grandmother's voice or saw your family enjoying life back in the 1950s or 60s? If the reason is you haven't known what to do with your old recordings, videos, and films, here's your answer. The Multimedia Center in Salt Lake City. We brought in a video project to the Multimedia Center, and overnight, they duplicated it to DVD so we could meet our deadline. The Multimedia Center, 2870 East, 3300 South, Salt Lake City. Open Monday through Friday, 10 to 6. Call 801-483-1717 or go to Transfer Duplication. Com. Genies, it's Fisher with exciting news. The Weekly Genie, the official newsletter of Extreme Genes, is here. It's your Monday morning briefing on what's happening in the world of genealogy and family history and on Extreme Genes. Get all the details of jaw-dropping stories of discovery and keep up with the latest techniques in family history research. Get to know more about your favorite Extreme Genes personalities. And it's free. Sign up for The Weekly Genie now at ExtremeGenes.com or 
or the Extreme Jeans Facebook page. And when you do, you'll receive David Allen Lambert's top 10 tips for beginning genealogists from the Chief Genealogist of the New England Historic Genealogical Society. Sign up today for the Weekly Genie. And we are back for our final segment of Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show for this week. Tom, we got another great email here. This is from Hanover, Massachusetts. Uh, Alexandra has a question for us. She says, in the 1980s, my late grandmother had some early 20th century photographs enlarged, and the enlargements were returned with negatives. But I believe that when she submitted the photos to them, she didn't have the original negatives. Well, that would make sense, right, Tom? Correct. <laughs> Did photo processing stores make negatives of photos in order to produce enlargements? And if so, I would assume those negatives are not as high resolution as the original photographs she submitted and which I luckily have. And that if I want to make copies, I should high res scan the original photographs and not the 1980s negatives derived from them, correct? Well, <laughs> the thing is, you gave us a lot of information, but there's not enough information. Okay. Based on you, what you said, I would assume, which we're not supposed to do, that they already made high resolution negatives. So if he got negatives back, I would assume that they took the photos like they did in the old days, and they actually, with a, a special camera, photograph the pictures and created a negative from those and those are usually extremely high resolution of they course usually look absolutely wonderful because they're all done optically they're not done digitally like they do nowadays so i would assume his negatives are going to be better than anything that he would get today because if you take the photo and put in a standard photo scanner even if it's a really good quality it's still not going to be as good as actually shooting it with a camera which they don't do today because there's so much more labor involved. It's so much more cost-effective the way we do it digitally now. So I would assume that your negatives are really, really high resolution. If you want to find out, take one of them and blow it up and see what it looks like. Get in there with a jeweler's loop and look at the pixels and see if it's really good graduation between the grays and the blacks. And also, are they 35-millimeter negatives? If so, that's probably what happened. If they're larger negatives, like uh, two by twos, two by fours, four by fours, four by eights, any of those sizes, then for sure they're going to be probably the original negatives that the original photographs were made for. Because very rarely would they make that large of negatives off of a photograph unless they were doing something very, very special. Right. And if they are doing something special, I can almost guarantee those are going to be extremely high resolution. And so just take those negatives, make print from that, and you should be good to go. Well, the question is, though, I mean, if you've got the negatives, and they are obviously higher than you would be if you, say, went up to 6,000, 7,000 DPI, right? But, right. But at the end of the day, you're still going to have to digitize to make an enlargement print if that's what the end goal is here. Well, possibly. There's still a lot of places across the country that will take those off-site negatives and actually make prints from them. And if you can find a place that does that, that's a great way to go. It's probably going to be more expensive, but it'll be the ultimate cream of the cream you can get. It'll be wonderful. However, like you mentioned, if you want to do other things with it, you definitely want to get those large negatives and digitize the large negatives because you're going to have more information on a negative than you are on a print. And then once you have those digital things, then you're going to Photoshop all kinds of fun things, colorize them, fix any cracks in them, any problems. But I would definitely do whatever you're going to do from those negatives because I'm pretty much guessing those are going to be the, the strongest thing you have to start your project with. All right. As always, Tom, great advice, and thanks so much for the question. And if you would like to ask Tom a question, it's real easy to do. You can email him at asktom at tmcplace.com, or you can ask him on his Twitter page at asktomp. Thanks so much, Tom. We'll talk to you again next week. My pleasure. Wow, the time goes by fast when we do this show. Thanks once again to our guests. We've talked about lost cemeteries, surprising DNA results, and hopefully uh, some material that can help you as you continue your genealogical journey. Hey, next week, by the way, we're going to be talking poor folks across the pond and here in the United States and some special records that they left behind because... Well, people didn't want to be taking care of poor folks. That's why you might be able to find them just because of what their financial status was at that time. Hey, don't forget to sign up for our Weekly Genie newsletter at ExtremeGenes.com. Talk to you again next week. Thanks for joining us. And remember, as far as everyone knows, we're a nice, normal family. 